in these lives of very great activism of these 16th century Protestants, uh, uh, including Calvin himself, uh, he always rep they always represent themselves as when they come to self-description as being put in play by by God and as being put in play. Like, Calvin, the world's most uh, 16th, 16th century's most energetic and uh, assured uh, preachers and men and writers uh, always said, oh, I was just really a shy, reserved, tiring person, but God would not let me be that way. I just wanted to go off and work quietly, be a scholar, but God put me into play, as he did David. <laughs> and you have here again the sense that he has been put into play other than, and, and saved. Uh, uh, and then secondly, and this is really something I only thought of as I was reading it this time, uh, there is uh, a, the extension of the martyrdom that he'd seen in the streets uh, uh, of France to this voyage. Because remember, we talked before about the dangers. These are very dangerous voyages. That people look really scary, very, very scary. They require lots of courage. Uh, and uh, on, t on top of everything else, uh, it now, I mean, you then have to get there. And then there was the danger from being what they thought would be safe from Villagagnon, and then the dangers from the indigenous peoples, you know, they could be uh, seized and killed and eaten by uh, the, uh, the Portuguese, the, uh, get these names right, are the, Mar the Margarita, Margra, put this down, is it Margra Margrias? I guess it is the enemies. I've just I've written that down so we shouldn't get that right. So I think there is a martyrdom, there, there's a martyrdom personal story here. It's a Protestant part of the story. There's also the part of the story that is so uh, uh, beautifully evoked at the end of uh, the Certeaux's, the story of delight and the story of memory. Uh, and though it only surfaces now again, I mean, the, the, the Providence martyrdom is a kind of overall personal theme uh, that he comes back to, to witness and to continue the Protestant, the Protestant quest and the Protestant uh, mission. The other just comes up in flashes um, in those wonderful quotations about um, uh, the, uh, the battle scene. So extraordinary, the feathers. Uh, even though he's critical of their violence and of their uh, unending vengeance, uh, because it leads to well, because it leads to this unending warfare. Uh, that 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 scene in which the, the colors and the feathers, all the the swords moving so quickly and the arrows moving so quickly, better better. Uh, uh, Target men than the uh, than the English, and he's he's he says it's, it gives him a feeling of what was his phrase? Was it delight? Uh, I've never taken so much pleasure in seeing the infantry. I will say this about it, however, though I've often seen men of arms over here, both on foot and on horseback. Nevertheless, I've never taken so much pleasure in seeing the infantry with their gilded helmets and shining arms, as I delighted then in seeing those savages do battle. There was not only the entertainment of seeing them leap, whistle, and wield their swords so dexterously in circles and pass odds, it was also a marvel to see so many arrows fly in the air and sparkle in the sunbeams with their grand featherings of red, blue, green, scarlet, and other colors, and so many robes, headdresses, bracelets, and other adornments of these natural feathers with which the savages were engraved. So we've got that as one of them. There's the, um, uh, you remember the one about the smell of, uh, not here, the, the taste of, uh, not Madeleine, but the, the yes, the smell of the starch. She says, whenever I smell starch being made in France, 
I think again, uh, and, and, and it's a pleasurable thought of how much he really, uh, he really liked the manioc flower. Uh, after I came back over here, whenever I happened to be in a place where starch was being made, the scent of it made me remember the odor one usually picks up in the savage's house when they are making root flour, and he liked the taste. He really said he liked it as, as, as well as any fresh white bread that he could get. And then the third moment of memory, uh, which he, in which he doesn't use the word pleasure, but once he's talking about the problems of representation, and he says, all of a sudden, I will see them, I will remember in my mind how they looked and how their gestures were. It's so hard to represent it. Uh, it's hard to put it in the way you have to see it. But you have the sense of him suddenly remembering this totally distant past, one that, that he could not have expected when he was growing up in Burgundy, and that uh, uh, has left this imprint of both of memory uh, and uh, of delight. And I have to say, uh, and I'm going to come back to this in a moment, uh, quite different from the kinds of experiences of the many other Protestant pastors that I know, because I know a lot of these Protestant pastors in the 16th century and their, their lives before they became Protestant, the things that they'd seen, and they'd, had, they'd seen a lot. Uh, they have diverse backgrounds, but this is quite extraordinary. It's, it's quite extraordinary as an interlude uh, in, in his life. Well, I, I thought um, what I'd conclude was on him before we turn briefly to uh, De Certeau was just to review with you, uh, though there's much more that's going on in the text, just I thought it would be helpful to review to you ways in which Protestant sensibility and doctrine uh, are expressed in the uh, history uh, and some of the tensions that I see, some of the things that seem to me to work against uh, that, uh, against this, uh, uh, or which, which I would have expected would have provided a rupture uh, in his life, and, and or at least a period in which he would have had to suspend, uh, and, and in fact did, must, did have to suspend certain forms of Protestant action, certain forms of Protestant sense, really. Uh, so some fit perfectly. Uh, one is, and this has been treated, but maybe you'll want to say more about it, the connection between uh, cannibalism and uh, transubstantiation. Uh, and that, he makes that explicit uh, in the text when he talks about the group of savages who are so extreme that they're beyond the margias and the tupis and their violence. Uh, just eat everything raw, they don't even cook. Uh, and he may compares that to uh, Catholics who so insist on transubstantiation, and Ville Gagnon, who wants to backtrack. It's so interesting that the, the main the issue that he begins with, with he accuses Ville Gagnon of wanting to backtrack on, is uh, the Calvinist definition of spiritual presence, that Christ is present but only spiritual uh, in the wafer and in the blood. And that uh, Ville Gagnon, who sounds like a very bossy person, and absolutely again, <laughs> typical, 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 typical to me uh, of, uh, of the Protestant nobility who didn't totally like Protestant pastors coming in who are not as high status as they and telling them what to believe. Uh, and that's very characteristic. I, mean, I, I just could think of several examples of, of uh, just exactly in the late 1550s of some of these new, new reform nobles who said, what, you're telling me, you, and you're not even a priest, you're just a plain old Protestant minister. But at any rate, it's on this question of uh, uh, transubstantiation that um, the, um, the cannibalism, I mean, I, th I think we should, we, we should uh, talk about it. I only wanted to add a word to what I said a little earlier uh, when I was giving you background uh, on the, uh, uh, the eating of prisoners, of, of dead prisoners, in, uh, among the Iroquois and the Hurons a few weeks ago. This is somewhat, looks like a somewhat different setting here. Do you recall that when I talked to you about it then, I discussed uh, the eating as part of a general set of policies and corporation, which is what it really is. Uh, that in the north, among those eastern woodlands uh, communities, it was coupled, and you can't separate it with uh, uh, seizing some prisoners and keeping them alive forever as, as males, almost always male slaves. Keeping some alive and marrying the women 
So the women uh, became part of the community, and they, they, uh, and in some cases, keeping the men alive, not as slaves, as, as servants, but as adopting them actually into the tribe as sons, uh, or marrying them, uh, so that there was there was uh, a, 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 a several ways of actually incorporating the enemy in and replenishing. I don't like the functional. I don't like this to sound functional, but it, it, it in fact was functional of replenishing groups that were sorely uh, beset by the loss of, of especially men in battle, so that you actually replaced, you, 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 you made peace by, you didn't make permanent peace, but you stopped temporarily things by a process of incorporation. I was quite struck in the North by the combination of adoption, marriage, uh, and eating as three, I mean, as, as associated, these are really our associated strategies, and that's definitely the case in the North. Now, here, I was quite struck by the fact that it's not, and I have to, we have to really look into the Tupi literature, but uh, it's certainly not mentioned by Watley, and I haven't had time to look into it, that there's no, that he claims that all the prisoners are killed, all the women and all the men, and that, that the, uh, the men given to women for a time are then slain, and that if the woman is pregnant, the child is eaten, or she tries to abort the child. Uh, maybe that's true. Maybe that's true. Uh, I would I would be want to check that a little bit further. But I have just a thought to add to much that has been written uh, about uh, uh, this question of, of uh, ritual ritual cannibalization of uh, slain prisoners. Uh, following something that you're, I, I, I'm following something that he quotes. Uh, the prisoner is saying, and that will be picked up uh, by Morten in, in the De Carnival. Those of you who read it will remember that, that the prisoner, uh, uh, before dying, has a chance not only to take revenge, they hope, I think, to pacify his spirit but by throwing stones, but he speaks and uh, speaks of uh, the, the eating that has been done by his own uh, people, uh, and that it will happen again. This, I'm not sure whether he actually uses the quote here that we're going to pick up in Montaigne next time, that you will eat my flesh, but my flesh is made up of the flesh of your ancestors because my people have eat you. And the thing that I, it occurred to me, uh, uh, and I'm here actually applying in, uh, in a very different direction, Inga Clendenin's writing about not Aztec cannibalism, but Aztec sacrifice, human sacrifice. Very, very interesting uh, study, uh, wonderful book. Uh, in which he looks at things cyclically, you know, that you have a cycle, a cycle. Here it's not the cycle, as in the Montaigne quote, or the thing suggested here, of you be not fully you, but it's, it's, it's the life cycle that suddenly occurred to me. I guess I was thinking, I don't have a text to turn it to. It's, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just do a kind of psychological analysis rather than a text, uh, but uh, de Certo, I think, would approve. Uh, I was thinking, uh, I was putting the scene together of the, the little, the mother who says, the prisoner, the Margie a prisoner, uh, at, at Villa Gagnon's fort, who when she is offered the possibility of, I guess her son going to France, being bought going to France, so that he won't have to be a prisoner anymore. Uh, she says, but I'd rather he, I don't want to be a prisoner, but I'd rather he, he died here with me rather than going off to France and far away. And what I really wish is that he could go up and become a warrior and, and fight. Uh, and if he had to die, be eaten, <laughs> being slain. Remember that, that extraordinary scene? And I thought, now, if that's the way a mother is raising her boy, let's assume that this is a correct quotation for a moment. Uh, and, and that the other quotations of people being willing to, uh, of the men egging each other on to be brave and seek vengeance and to go into battle and be willing to be prisoners and be eaten, then that must, that is not only heroic death, but it must be, instead of it's horror to us, it must be even thought of as a, the mother is telling this to her boy, a kind of safer death, and it occurred to me, and I don't know that this is in literature, I mean, I'm just going to go look it up, maybe it is, that you're born from a woman's body, and then you die, incorporated into somebody's body, into a woman's body or into a man's body. 
And although they have this idea that we know from from uh, uh, from Delery and from others that the soul is separate, so that there isn't a, there is an afterlife of a kind, including even a resurrection of the body. But in terms of just the physicalness of something which is so repellent to us and to uh, to European thoughts, I could sort of see how a mother. I mean, I began to see how that sort of present it that way. Not that I'm recommending it. I was trying to see. It was especially the scene with the mother. And it, it could be that, that uh, um, at any rate, I'm going to come back to this notion of closure, of cycle and closure, and it could be, this is my addition, there's not a precise text, but I repeat it, suggested by the, the, mother's, the mother's words to Delery, uh, that you could have an additional closure where, where uh, what seems to us so frightening uh, would seem like um, a cozy death, a, a bodily death. Because the other, the other option is being put into the ground in and in, in what is in fact a fetal position. Do you remember that? So anyway, I'm just, this is not something that he says, but I just want to, I wanted to take this moment to, to talk to, to bring it in because I do want to come back to the idea of, of, a, of a cycle, of a, of a closed of, of, uh, cannibalism as a uh, method of autonomy for a, a society that, that is, is closed in certain kinds of ways, that, is, that closes in upon itself. Anyway, secondly is um, Protestant textuality. Uh, this again is sort of obvious, but let's just not forget it. Um, the very great stress although not exclusive stress in Protestantism. It would be absolutely wrong to call it exclusive. 16th century Protestantism is focuses also on very attentive to preaching and the word being preached, but the writing of the word. Uh, and this uh, surfaces not only in his own sense of writing the story uh, and writing it as, as a Protestant story, but in the section that de Certeau quotes, and that I'm sure you noticed on uh, Watley talks about it on the importance of literacy and the uh, natives' astonishment at their writing. Uh, when we talk about the Jesuits, let's come back to this uh, this question of uh, the topos that you get in these texts of uh, the natives being utterly astonished. Uh, it's reproduced. Any of you see the movie Black Robe? It's reproduced. That's from a very, it's, it's, you'll see when you read this. It's, they, they reproduce this utter astonishment. Uh, and it's from a very, very early moment in Father Lejeune's writing. Uh, he's just been there a very, very short amount of time. And it's, he tells about this. I'm, I have wondered a little bit about that for the eastern woodlands of Canada, whether that was a little bit over-exaggerating <laughs> the natives' astonishment, uh, since they did have, um, uh, as, as I maybe told you last, I guess we discussed this when we were talking about the Iroquois and the Hurons, they did have ways of recording messages through the, you'll remember, through the uh, wampum belts, our actual messages, our memory devices. And they had all kinds of things up north. They had memory sticks uh, that told you where, where the shamans were to go from one song to another. There were, and they had ways of mapping. They had these maps they would draw on the ground. Uh, so I've sort of wondered about this. They thought we were like gods and so forth that you get in the 17th century. Uh, maybe, maybe there isn't any pre-writing form of communication. Maybe the cowrie shells that are being strung here don't have messages in them. Again, one would have to go and look at the two P literature. But anyway, whether it's true or not is neither here nor there. Uh, he makes the point about the wondrousness of, of writing. Third point is sexuality and family structure, uh, and uh, he uh, here you have both approval and disapproval, that is, he approves of the modesty. Well, the, the, Calvin, you know, the Calvin position on this, uh, the reform position, is that uh, human concupiscence may not be good, but we all have it. And the Catholic quest for celibacy, uh, as represented in the priesthood and monks and nuns and so forth, is simply uh, doomed to failure. Uh, men. Uh, it, it was already thought of, even by the Catholics, as sort of difficult for women, but they thought men especially could achieve it by various techniques of prayer and asceticism. And the Protestant position is it's a rare continence, is a rare gift of God. Um, 
and uh, humans, uh, in a way, the Protestants are saying men are sort of like women, they can't control their consciences it's better than women, and any, any who claim to do so are hypocrites. Uh, so you have in, 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 in 16th century Reformed Protestantism uh, an affirmation of physical desire and an insistence that it be expressed in one place only in the uh, non-sacramental but holy union of marriage and not before marriage or outside of marriage. And they establish uh, in Geneva, and I'll come back to this, uh, a system of discipline, consistorial system, which uh, in place of a system of private confession, which really checks into this very, very actively uh, and uh, with, with representatives from every single neighborhood. Uh, and uh, when de Lerie in, in, a, in a city, checking into people and people coming, reporting on people, uh, and, and every week hauling people in for one or another uh, wrong thing being done in the area of sexuality, dancing, dress, and the rest. And he had seen this in Geneva, and he was part of this in Geneva. Uh, it was just being put really into place in the 50s just before he went over. So when he talks about, I mean, this is an extraordinary displacement and discovery, when he discovers uh, uh, the ways in which nudity can be conducted uh, without, uh, he claims, without uh, it being lustful, uh, uh, not leading to priorities, all the words that you get in Geneva, uh, that is uh, something that he likes and, and can use uh, in regard to, uh, to Europe. He uh, doesn't comment on their family structure, which is not a patriarchal European family. These are, are uh, uh, houses uh, with multiple families living within them. He does say that there's a longhouse, uh, what we call the North Longhouse, a large house. Uh, he uh, uh, is delighted uh, when the one thing he likes about Villegagnon is that he prevents the Frenchmen from having sexual intercourse with the women, although some of them jumped over and, and done so, and are living, uh, and many of their interpreters are doing that. But he likes that. He uh, describes their premarital fornication. Uh, I don't know that he expresses distaste. It's something that would not fit with his notions. Uh, he approves of the uh, severe punishment for adultery, although it is not death in Geneva, except in very unusual cases, uh, where, where there's been outrageous violation of family values. Uh, it, is, it is punished in Geneva, not by death, as he claims it is, it is, it is here. Uh, he uh, likes, uh, he, note, he notes the division of labor, where the women work harder than the men. Uh, I'll come back to this when we talk about the in, in a moment. The men do work. They hunt and fish, and that isn't so easy. And they do make tools. Uh, and the feathers, I mean, the women do all the textile. Uh, reminds me of something I forgot to mention. I'm going to bracket something, hold on to this family for a minute. Textile reminds me of, that in thinking of memory, talking of his personal story, and his memory, he not only, just to remind you of something, he not only had his memories, uh, his free soul of delight, but he, some of the things he brought back uh, survived the trip. You remember that the, he had to eat the uh, shields he brought back. Uh, and the parrot, uh, as did others. But he did manage to get his feathers back, when he describes that. And the cut uh, thread, was it, was it either kind of the cut thread of the women? And he had white doublets made of them. He got back and described it. But she says, everyone thought of this is beautiful as silk. So again, to think of him, what he's carrying back, his wig, when he puts on those doublets, uh, he, you know, he has, the cotton of, of Brazil upon him. Uh, so it isn't just in his memory he has that, he has that garment made from that. Uh, back to, made by, uh, by something that initially went back to women's agriculture and women's, uh, women's work, women's gathering, women's work. Uh, so on the whole, this, uh, he, there's some things he doesn't like about their picture, but on the whole he can use, when he, he interprets that, what he likes about it, he will interpret within the frame of a uh, companionate marriage uh, with the husband firmly in charge. It is where the wife knows, uh, is, shares religion with him, uh, shares the Bible with him, but as he says, is obedient uh, and, and cheerful. 
and he likes the uh, cohort of, of uh, those, those men who have several wives, and, and only the, some of the two people can afford to have several wives. Uh, he likes the fact that they all get along so well, so cheerful, and go about their work without complaining. He uses this. Uh, language, so um, the, the language theme, uh, this is, I just wanted to add something, perhaps not the most important thing to say about the fascination with language, the Saratoga's discussion of translation, when he goes at it is perhaps more important, but I just want to add something. That the question of translation and of the vernacular is deeply important for these 16th century uh, Protestants. Uh, they, I mean, uh, Calvin, uh, translates uh, and Olivier and uh, Olivier Tal translate the Bible. You remember I talked to you about that when we had our day in the about the uh, feeling of, of kind of uh, pre I mean, a kind of eschatological feeling about that that uh, beautiful first edition of the Bible, which we don't have here in Toronto, uh, but where they talk about giving back to the to the readers, the, the faithful, something that had been wrongly stolen from them by the priests, and they're giving this, this wonderful book back to them. Uh, and so that, and how to translate well, um, and all the issues in translation is central to them. And then, how, uh, and, and how to translate the Psalms and all the hymns into, into vernacular is something centrally important to them. And the, the editions are just coming off the press in the Geneva of the 1550s, and then increasingly in the 1560s when he comes back uh, from Delary, and then preaching long sermons in languages that people can, can understand. Now, this was very complicated in France because some people couldn't understand French. Uh, it, they, therefore, the sermons had to be in Gascon, they had editions of the Psalms in Gascon, and, and how many, and in, in, in the language of the Basque country, and it was very much debated among the Protestants how many vernaculars they would have, whether was they going to just, were they going to push for a French vernacular that all the, the non-learned people in, in France would, would move toward, or were they going to make uh, concessions to these different regional, uh, regional languages. So I just want to mention that. It, it, it isn't particularly discussed in, by de Sartre Watley. And uh, as something at, that when he comes, uh, this is not his first confrontation with the question of, of translation. He's already got a, a huge background uh, with it as a young uh, minister uh, in a uh, city-state uh, and in a movement that is just talking about this uh, all the time. So that's another, uh, another thing I think I would add to a uh, Protestant impulse to this text. Uh, the plain style topos that you get early along, I'm. I'm not going to write fancily. I'm going to write very simply. I can't write fancily. Actually, it's it's it, the French is it's very lively. And, uh, you were reading it uh, uh, in French, as I recall, and enjoying it. And uh, I, I never did get hold of get down to buy my my full French version. So I've I read it in the 1578 edition, which we had at Princeton, but I didn't uh, I'd get a chance to to buy it. But uh, your own sense of it was that it, it uh, it's a much more accessible French than the. The, the yeah, I remember saying, I'm scared of the this one. Well, this one I didn't have a parallel text, but yeah. I got into it and it just started off. Oh, it moves right, right. I forgot about this. Yes, it's, it's a, uh, but the, the plain style topos, though, it, it is, is also uh, a Protestant topos. That is that the, uh, and beware, I mean, uh, of course these are, these sermons, like Calvin sermons are extremely, artfully contrived, uh, and their lucidity is, took, took a certain amount of doing. Uh, but the, the topos always is uh, to beware of rhetoric. When, when, you, when you went to the academy, which is where he was going to school when he was shipped off, cho chose or volunteered to be one of the 15, uh, one of the things you learned was uh, how to preach. Um, since that was the, the central point besides the certainty, besides the Psalms. Of, of a Protestant service. That was the main thing that you did. And, and the pre, the pastor was the big dramatic figure. And you had to learn how to do it without a microphone in these large, cavernous churches, not always in a small place, and keep people listening for an hour or so and keep them from falling asleep. Because the, the Catholic sermons were, except at Lent, were usually quite little short affairs. And these went on twice a week, Wednesdays and Sundays. And one of the things that was always said 
was beware of rhetoric because that will violate the truth of the gospel. Uh, and the attack on the fancy, you know, the fancy language is not only uh, perhaps an attack on, on the, uh, Paul Saar, but what he had learned before he went and then what he had learned in the practice when he was preaching. The idea was that God, it wasn't that God, that God would somehow, in some sense, would guide you, not that you were literally possessed, but in some sense God would guide your speech and you wouldn't have to fall back on the, the uh, theatricals. Uh, lies that the Catholics used at the Latin sermons, the Franciscans, like the one that I